So I want you to think of a world where the person, you as an individual, is in control of your own energy. And not only is it you, but it could be also the richest person in the world in the biggest villa on Lake Coma, or the poorest person in a little village in India and you're all in control of your own energy. And that is a future that's in your reach now. And that future is with that word called the sustainacine. It will be a new dawning for mankind. And what the sustainacine grows from is the geological epic that you currently live in. You live in what's called the Holocene. And that's a period where humans showed up as we know them on the face of the planet, and they begin living. But in the Holocene, there weren't many of us. And so we didn't alter world or global life systems. In the last 200 years, because there's so many of us now, you heard there's seven billion of us, we are starting to affect life systems, and especially the climate and the world that we live in. And that's called now the Anthropocene. What is the next epic of humankind? And this comes from an Australian physician, Brian Furness, and he mentioned the sustainacine. Now, what does the sustainacine mean? When you think of sustainability, inevitably you'll think about things like ecological sustainability or the environment. So you think about the earth itself. The part you always forget about is you, right? And what the sustainacine is is saying, you can't have the top you can't have environmental integrity or ecological sustainability if you have a big divide between the poor, the have-nots, and the rich, the haves. As if you have this big difference between the poor and the wealthy, you can never, ever, ever have ecological sustainability. And that really matters when it comes to energy. So, you just heard, there was a talk before, that energy has three factors. Actually, only two were mentioned, but there's three. One is population. So you're all energy users. You can calculate it right now. If you calculate the number of calories that you eat in a given day, I can tell you how bright a light bulb you are and you're a 100 watt light bulbs. That's why you all look so bright and shiny to me right now, all right? Um, so population, because you're all energy users, and then we heard how rich you are as a country. GDP, gross domestic product, or money per person. If you live in a world that is very affluent, then you have lots of things made for you. And so that means you'll use more energy. And then the thing that wasn't mentioned is conservation. Conservation has an equation. I'm a scientist. We put equations on everything. Right? So if I have a GDP or I have a country that wants to get to a certain amount of money, if I can get there using less energy than I've conserved, that means my energy intensity has, is in the right direction. If I need more energy to get to the GDP, then I'm not conserving. So when you take the three factors, population, money per capita, and conservation, I can calculate energy. And that's what is at the heart of the sustainacine because you heard, actually, the unit is, right now, the world is burning a 16 trillion watt light bulb. Right? So that's the way you can think about it. So the unit that you are hearing about is a trillion watts. And so think about the Earth as you're living now, and it's burning a big, big light bulb, 16 trillion watts, and you're giving it energy to keep the light bulb on. And it's mostly coal, oil, and gas. We already know that. In the next 
40 years, and you can close your eyes and think about somebody young in your life and add 40 to their age, you will be needing another 16 trillion watts. You're going to double your energy. And it turns out people in the developed world have good energy intensity. They're using less energy than they've ever used before. So why would you need 16 trillion watts more energy equivalents if you're doing the right thing, conserving? And it's what you heard before. It's because right now, there's only 3 billion energy users in the world. There's 3 billion low energy users. And then there's 3 billion unborn people. So in the next 40 years, your population is going to go from 7 billion to 10 billion. And most of the people that are coming into the world are coming into parts of the world where there is no energy. You heard right now there is 1.6 billion people with no electricity. So it's the poor who are driving the energy need of the future. And that's why this question of energy fits the sustainacine. If you don't give those people the right energy, and the right thing isn't to wag your finger at them and tell them they can't have energy, that's the wrong thing to do, they should have energy. But if they have the wrong type of energy, and it's the energy we use, coal, oil, and gas, there's no way you're going to have a sustainable planet. So the race is on right now in science and technology to get those six billion people, three billion low energy users or no energy users, three billion people to come, to get those six billion people who will all be new energy users the right flavor of energy. And that's why this energy problem aligns with the sustainacine. Only when you take care of the poor can you have a sustainable planet. And that means that you have to do a different type of science. And so, what scientists tend to do is they make things bigger and brighter, brighter, shinier. I call it EST science, the biggest, the fastest, the smallest, right, tiniest. That's what we do. But that's not what you need to do for the poor. What you need to do is make things very inexpensive for them. So could I give them an energy system that is inexpensive? So here's my greatest aspiration in life. I would just like to become the McDonald's of energy systems. So think of a McDonald hamburger. We're just going to make a bunch of McDonald hamburgers. I'm going to each give you your McDonald hamburger, and that's going to be enough energy for you to use. And it's got to be very simple. So it's not trying to get the most efficient or the bestest. It's actually doing something simple that's cheap that I can get to the poor. And that's not how we work. You work in what's called a centralized energy world. So you build one big power pl planet, plant, or one nuclear plant, or something big, and then it costs a lot, say a billion dollars, and then I sell it back to you, you give me money, and then I can make a profit. So the way we do energy now is it's centralized with a high cap X, meaning high capital expenditure, expenditure, high output of money. You pay for it, and then you make a profit. And it's all carbon-based. The future, I'm arguing, is going to be totally distributed, low capital expenditure, and I'm going to tell you what the source is. It's going to be the sun and water, just not the sun. You also need water. Now, in case you haven't realized it, Wherever you go and wherever you walk, the sun seems to be following you, and she warms you up, and she's been trying to tell you, use me, but you're not listening. Okay? So, you aren't as smart as plants, because plants do listen to the sun. And so, why do plants actually do a thing called photosynthesis? It's because when the sun is out, you can use it. You could set up solar panels on your house, and you could run your house. So that's fine. But then the sun goes down. Then what do you do? When the sun goes down at night for the plant, how does the plant keep living? So the plant stores energy. And the way the plant stores energy is you give the plant some water, the sunlight comes in, and believe it or not, 
What the plant is doing when you're giving it water is it's taking the sunlight into the leaf and then splitting water to hydrogen and oxygen. So what you're doing is you're taking the bonds of H2O, drinking water, and then you're rearranging the bonds using sunlight to make hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen's a high-valued fuel. You can give hydrogen in the plant to CO2 and make sugar. That's just a solid form of hydrogen. You then eat the carbohydrate, you release hydrogen inside yourself in a solid form, and then you breathe the oxygen in, and now you run the reaction backwards, hydrogen plus oxygen, and that gives you energy. You're releasing the sunlight inside your body effectively to keep you living, if you've ever thought about it. So that's the full cycle of photosynthesis. Now, I told you you're going to need 16 trillion watts, and that's going to be very difficult to get through to. If you wanted to get half of that energy, 8 trillion watts from nuclear, you would have to build a new nuclear power plant every 1.5 days forever to maintain 8 trillion watts. Just think about it. One nuclear power plant every day and a half forever. So to get 16 more is going to be a tough thing to do unless you listen to nature. That's the Harvard swimming pool. If I could make a little hamburger, hand it out to all of you, you hold it up to the sun, and you had a swimming pool worth of water, you're not all going to need a swimming pool. You just need a little bottle. But if it were the equivalent of a full swimming pool plus sunlight and my hamburger to take the sunlight in to split water to make hydrogen and oxygen like photosynthesis, you would store 38 terawatts of energy and you only need 16. So that's the answer to the energy problem. Just sunlight plus water. But I can't do a big centralized plant. I need to give you the McDonald's hamburger equivalent of an energy system. And so that means I need to do artificial photosynthesis. And I will tell you, people have been talking about this a long time. This is Chimichan, the first sun chemist, sun photochemist, actually from the University of Bologna. Chimichan, if you go up to Bologna, you'll find the Chimichan Institute. He would only study chemical reactions that he had in beakers that he would put on the roof of the chemistry building. And he would look, and if he didn't see anything would happen, he would just throw it away. If he saw a reaction, he would study it. And in 1912, he said, if we could replace oil and coal with the sun, that would be nice for us. And then the question is, could we figure out the guarded secret of plants? And so let me tell you what a plant does. And here's my only science nerdy slide. Sunlight comes into the leaf. And then what happens is you make a wireless current. So when the sunlight comes in, you make charge move. When charge moves in a wire, you get current. That's what you use to run things. That current is an energized current that inside the plant is fed to two machines that then operate on water. One part of the machine makes the oxygen, and the other part of the machine makes hydrogen when it's energized. So a few years ago, we wondered, could we make something? That's, one, that's what it looks like. It's a wafer. It's a hamburger. I'm going to prove that to you. And then that thing does exactly what the plant does. When sunlight hits it, I make a wireless current. And then that, I have machines I've invented that are layered on top of that wafer that then can take water to hydrogen and oxygen, just like the plant. And this is what it looks like. It's a piece of silicon. We have to put a protective coating. And then the green and the red layers are things we invented in our, my lab. They're called catalysts. And just like photosynthesis, when sunlight comes into silicon, silicon's what's in a solar panel when it's on top of your roof, it makes electricity, but without wires. And then the electricity is fed to my catalyst, and we split water to hydrogen and oxygen. You can literally just drop that in a glass of water, go up to a window, have sunlight hit it, and you see bubbles come off. On the front side's coming off oxygen, and the back side's hydrogen. No engineering. Okay? It's just 
But by the way, I like that movie because I like looking at myself during uh, presentations. It looks just like a hamburger. See, look, the silicon is the burger, the protective layer is the cheese, one catalyst is the top bun, and the other is the bottom bun. And literally, you can just spray coat this, just like hamburgers flying by, and then everybody can take their little piece of artificial leaf, a bottle and a half of drinking water, and if I gave the poor a bottle and a half of drinking water to hydrogen and oxygen a day, they would have one-tenth the energy that you have in your life today. So that's kind of the McDonald's energy system, and we call it the artificial leaf. It's no wires, works in any water, works out of urine. Why is that nice? Because then you can split it to hydrogen and oxygen. When you recombine, you get energy out in clean drinking water. You're not using up the water, because when you split to hydrogen and oxygen, when you recombine it to get the energy back, you get the water back. Okay. And so we really like that invention. To end, I just want to prove to you, you've already done this before, not with energy, but with computing. In the 60s and 70s, you used to have big mainframes, and you forgot about them, because now you have personal computers. The grid is the mainframe, right? So what you're suggesting now is, can you take things like the artificial leaf and those technologies, just like your personal computer, and generate your own energy? What the special thing is that your home then becomes its own power station and gas station. You don't have to go to the man to get your energy anymore, because she's shining on you. Take any water. You're good to go. And the most important thing, it puts on an equal footing the poorest people in the world and richest people in the world, because they all have access to the same energy. So thank you very much.